Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there will be some explicit language used in today's episode. Listener discretion is advised. In 1994, a Southern Gothic nonfiction novel became an overnight success. New York Magazine writer John Barrett had traveled to Savannah, Georgia to cover a society Christmas party for Town & Country magazine. He was transfixed by the eccentric citizens and culture. In the film version of the book, his character would famously say, this place is fantastic. It's like Gone with the Wind on Mescaline. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil spent a record-breaking 216 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list before Clint Eastwood adapted it into a film in 1997. The movie got mixed reviews and didn't perform well at the box office. It would seem that Eastwood struggled to capture the seductive charm of Barrett's novel. It didn't help that the courtroom scenes bogged down what started out as a fun movie populated with the fascinating characters of Savannah as seen through Barron's eyes. The central plot of the movie and book is the 1981 murder of a young man named Danny Hansen. And even though the court scenes in the movie were deemed boring, they were nothing compared to the actual four trials Danny's killer would go through. The scandal fueled by the trials of a nouveau riche, semi-closeted gay man enthralled Savannah. For the better part of 30 years, Jim Williams had made his fortune and glided through the elite society of one of the South's oldest cities. But he was still considered new money when he shot his lover dead in his famous mansion. Welcome to episode 111, The Real Garden of Good and Evil. The Savannah River forms most of the border between South Carolina and Georgia. The coastal city of Savannah, the oldest city in Georgia, was built on the banks alongside that river in 1733. It's the birthplace of the cotton gin and is rich with not just Southern history. In fact, Savannah is known as the first planned city in American history, with its prosperous ports and access to the Atlantic Ocean. Savannah was the unique playground of real-life pirates. In the early 1700s, these buccaneers and sailors traveling the seven seas would stop in Savannah for food and board. General John Oglethorpe, who discovered Georgia and named it for King George II, laid out the city in a series of grids with wide streets and shady parks. There are 22 of the original 24 public squares left in Savannah today, graced with huge, sweeping oak trees dripping with Spanish moss. But it began as a revolutionary town, occupied by the British from 1778 to 1782 until the Redcoats left the city of their own accord. Like much of the South, after gaining its independence, Savannah's farmers learned to work with a profitable and rich soil. Originally a free colony, Georgia began utilizing slave labor to keep up with the farming of crops, most notably cotton. While the city's crops and economy grew on the backs and labor of the transatlantic enslaved men and women shipped into its ports, Savannah flourished. This all changed during the Civil War, when Savannah ports were blocked and the economy crumbled. Savannah's beauty was supposedly enough to stop the Union General Sherman from burning it to the ground during his infamous march to the sea in Georgia. There is much folklore as to why Sherman didn't burn Savannah, as he laid fiery siege to most of the state. One story is that the Savannah mayor, Dr. Richard Arnold, met Brigadier General John W. Geary and Sherman at the borders of the city and offered to surrender Savannah without a fight if they promised not to burn the city. Sherman then infamously sent a letter by steamer to President Abraham Lincoln on December 22, 1864, offering him the city as a Christmas present. It read, To His Excellency President Lincoln, Washington, D.C. 
I beg to present you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah with 150 heavy guns and plenty of ammunition, also about 25,000 bells of cotton. Lincoln received the letter on Christmas Day and was so delighted that Savannah was taken without bloodshed that he publicized the letter nationwide and an announcement was on the front page of the New York Times on December 26th. However, there is another popular rumor as to why Sherman didn't burn Savannah, that he had a mistress in the fair city. But that's just folklore. It is more likely that deals were made well ahead of time. No writing out to meet the general, but a deal made with the U.S. Department of Treasury. The city was saved for thousands of dollars worth of cotton that went to the U.S. government. Another more credible possibility is that Savannah, as a port city, made more sense to seize as a federal garrison and close off the ports to blockade runners. For whatever reason, Savannah was saved, and Sherman's letter, as well as Lincoln's reply, are held at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. After the war, Savannah had to rebuild. The former enslaved citizens developed their own community and culture, and in the process, established Savannah as one of the most historically significant African-American cities in the nation. By the 1950s, Savannah was once again set up to be a city full of preserved history and Southern tradition, and it is still known today as a city brimming with beauty and hospitality. The Savannah Historical Foundation was formed to preserve and restore Savannah's historic landmark buildings, notably the Pirate's House, the oldest structure in Savannah, built in 1734, as well as the first African Baptist church, established in 1788. During the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. praised Savannah for the nonviolent sit-ins, protests, and voter registration drives. Because of their hard work, a more progressive city government was elected, and the segregation laws were lifted more easily than in other old southern cities. He famously called Savannah one of the most desegregated cities in the Deep South. That's not to say that Savannah does not still reckon with ongoing race relations, along with the rest of the United States. Its citizens are 53% black and 38% white. But economic disparities are evident, and in the book Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, the author discusses crime and how it relates to the demographics. It is evident that at least during the 80s, the white people had the money and lived in Savannah's historic downtown, while black citizens tended to live on the outskirts where unemployment was much higher. Not all black citizens, of course, but the comparisons in the book are unavoidable and worth pointing out here. Some people he wrote about in his book casually use the N-word, and there is much made about the separation of the two races, despite what happened in the 1960s, including a detailed chapter on the author attending a black cotillion. Savannah's black wealthy socialites had their own debutante ball. Because of the offensive language, including homophobic words, the book has been banned in many libraries over the years. And race relations are still an ongoing problem almost 30 years after the publication of Barrett's book. There is no getting around it. But go to any travel website, and that's not the savanna that is portrayed. They keep to the heritage of beauty and grace. With its gnarled and twisted trees dating back hundreds of years and its cobblestone paths, Savannah paints the picture of a fairy tale played out in contemporary times. But the events that took place in Savannah on May 2, 1981, were all too real, becoming a salacious scandal the city couldn't get enough of. The murder of Danny Hansford in the famed Savannah Mercer House led to a historic set of trials in Georgia and a story of intrigue. This is the case of the real Garden of Good and Evil. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. Former Chatham County Chief Assistant District Attorney 
Deb Kirkland, wrote a book about the famous murder called Lawyer Games, After Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Kirkland told the Savannah Morning News that the book, quote, tells the truth, including facts never introduced in a courtroom. He said he didn't dislike John Barrett's book and actually enjoyed reading it, but he said, quote, it was, in my view, a well-written mix of fiction and nonfiction. The book should never be mistaken for nonfiction, however. The book wasn't really designed as a crime novel. That's the fiction surrounding the book. Which is fair. Barrett himself told the Houston Chronicle that he changed the order of some events and fabricated some scenes. The murder victim in the true story is named Danny Lewis Hansford, and he was born on March 1, 1960, in Savannah, Georgia, to parents Emily and Charles. His childhood and adolescent years were plagued by the tumultuous lives of his parents, who had gotten married in 1955 when his mother was just 15 years old. At the age of 17, Emily was pregnant with her and Charles's first child, Danny's oldest brother, and another son followed shortly after. By June of 1959, Emily was pregnant with her third son, Danny, and a year later, Emily and Charles divorced. When Danny was seven years old, his father, who had truly never played a role in his life, died by suicide. Danny's mother had remarried two years after her divorce and had given birth to her first daughter, but her second marriage was again short-lived, and Danny was without a father figure at the age of 10 years old. By age 11, Danny and his brothers were placed in Bethesda Orphanage near Savannah, now a boys' academy. Against the recommendation of the orphanage, Emily was able to pull her sons out. It wasn't the first time that Danny would be taken out of his mother's care. On three different occasions, Danny was removed from his home and sent to the Gould Cottage, a home for children living in troubled households. Each time, Arguing against the cottage's rules, Emily would retrieve Danny and take him back home. Danny was in the eighth grade when he dropped out of school, and he never returned. He spent just two days in a mental health facility when he was 15, before his mother refused their attempts at a family treatment plan and took her son home. According to trial transcripts, the staff at Georgia Regional wrote, Care and supervision of adolescent boys seems to be a problem for the mother. They also wrote that Emily needed support, but wasn't willing to, quote, take the time or accept responsibility for working out a plan. At the start of 1980, when Danny was 21, he began dating a woman named Debbie, who is his same age. While Debbie maintained that their arrangement was more casual than serious, Danny felt the opposite, and he had even proposed on several occasions. Despite his relationship with Debbie, she was not his sole sexual partner. Unbeknownst to his girlfriend, Danny worked as a male sex worker to make enough money to survive, or as some people saw it, to fund his drug habit. That is how he is said to have met Jim Williams, the infamous nouveau riche president of the Historical Society in Savannah, the man who restored the Mercer House. James Arthur Williams, known around the Savannah social scene as Jim, was born in December of 1930 to Arthur and Blanche Williams. His father worked as a barber, and his mother worked as a bookkeeper. Jim lived a modest life with his parents and sister Dorothy in Gordon, Georgia, about two hours from Savannah, where Jim would eventually establish his career and presence. Jim worked as an interior decorator before becoming an antiques dealer and historic preservationist at the age of 24. In his later years, Jim would go on to help preserve the historic district of Savannah and restore many homes throughout the state. As his career and wealth grew, so did his social life. According to LaGrange News, Jim was, quote, one of the best-known socialites in the city. In the late 1970s, invitations to his elite parties were highly sought after. Jim took up permanent residence in a Savannah, Georgia home he had restored at 429 Bull Street. The home, now widely known as the Mercer House, housed Jim's antiques business. 
including a refinishing shop in the basement. The grounds contained a carriage house, which was occupied with the commercial part of his business. According to Barrett and Kirkman's books, it was known around Savannah that Jim was a gay man. There are varying reports on just how Jim and Danny met and what their relationship entailed. While some say that Jim solicited Danny for sex in a local park, years later, Jim would claim that he met Danny in 1979 when he rode up to the Mercer house on his bike, looking for work. One of Jim's friends, Joseph Goodman, described Danny as nasty-looking. He said, quote, He could hardly talk. He was on drugs. He was always nasty. He had tattoos, dirty fingernails. He didn't bathe regularly, smelled horrible, and had green teeth. Despite the hair and makeup team for the film Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, Jude Law, who played Danny, is still Jude Law. It's hard to picture him as the rough guy Danny is described as. And a lot of friends could not understand why Jim, a skilled and successful businessman, was interested in associating with a man like Danny. When asked, Jim would tell people he wanted to save him. Jim claimed that he employed Danny as a part-time worker in his refinishing shop and allowed him to live in the Mercer house as needed. Some sources said that Danny had been living with Jim for two years. Others referred to him more euphemistically as a frequent house guest. Their relationship was complicated. While Danny was said to have helped with Jim's antique business, the bulk of their connection was centered around Danny and Jim's sexual relationship. Jim would provide Danny with a roof over his head, lavish gifts, and money, and in return, Danny would have sex with Jim. All the while, Danny still had a girlfriend, and Jim was not a fan. This created tension in their working relationship, with Jim resenting Danny's affections for Debbie. This tension came to a head in the early hours of May 2nd, 1981. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsors. According to court documents, at 2.58 a.m. on May 2, 1981, 50-year-old Jim called the Savannah Police Department, stating that there had been a shooting in the Mercer house. A mere 90 seconds after receiving the call, police arrived, followed by Jim's friend, Joseph Goodman. Jim opened the door and said, I shot him. He's in the other room. This would be his first story about what happened. Upon his greeting of the police, the responding officer said Jim, quote, did not appear emotionally upset. Jim escorted the police down the entrance hall to his study on the left. Just beyond the study entrance, a grandfather clock and chair appeared to have been turned over. As police entered the study, they saw a desk on the left. In front of the desk on an oriental rug was Danny's lifeless body. According to Savannah Morning News, Danny was, quote, lying in the antique-filled study in a pool of blood. It was evident that at least half an hour had passed since Jim had shot Danny and then called the police. According to the National Registry of Exonerations, police found Danny, quote, lying face down with a pistol under his right hand. He had been shot in the back, the chest, and above the right ear. Bullet holes in the floor corresponded to the shots in Danny's head and back, except that his head was facing to his left. The responding officer said he found smeared blood on the victim's right wrist and the victim's thumb and fingers on top of the gun. There was blood on the floor under Danny's body, but none in the vicinity of his right hand. Curiously, the leg of a chair was on top of Danny's pant leg. A bullet had passed through some papers on the desk, and lead fragments were recovered from a chair behind the desk. Placed on the desk, police found the pistol Jim had used to shoot Danny. Quote, there were also paper fragments on top of the gun, which had been used by the defendant. Four shell casings were found at various places in the room. Chief ADA Depp Kirkland was called to the scene. Based on his account, quote, 
Danny's right arm was extended from his body and his hand was perched on top of a handgun. There was blood caked on the hand, but no blood on the rug underneath his hand. The only source of blood was under the body. His thumb was tucked under, against the palm of the hand, and the fingers were squeezed together and tightly curled. Kirkland said the gun was aligned perfectly under Danny's hand, but wasn't in his hand. The hand was simply laid on top of the grip, with the thumb still tucked against his palm. The blood on the wrist was smeared. Danny's head was facing away from the weapon. He was supposed to have reached for a gun that he couldn't see. Kirkland insists that, quote, somebody had obviously pulled the hand out from under the body and laid it on top of a carefully placed weapon. It was clear to him that the scene had been staged. Kirkland also said that the chair, quote, was so far up over the body that it couldn't possibly have gotten there on its own. The most shocking proof of all that the scene had been rearranged was the chair's right rear leg squarely atop Danny's pant leg. There was only one explanation. The chair had to have been placed on top of the body after the fact. Danny had been shot with a World War II German Luger, which uses 9mm bullets. Danny was shot in the chest first. The second shot went through the right rear of Danny's head. It went through the rug and gouged the floor. The third shot was into Danny's back. According to Kirkland, the third shot into his back was clearly fired from almost directly above the body. The bullet passed through almost vertically, very slightly upward, and very slightly right to left, and embedded itself almost vertically in the hard wood directly underneath the exit wound. Before Danny's body was removed from the scene and taken to the hospital, his hands were allegedly covered with bags. Tests were later performed on Danny's hands, which returned no trace of gunpowder residue, according to the National Register of Exonerations. Police escorted Jim out of the room. He told an officer, quote, he was shooting at me and I shot him, and that he had attorneys on the way. This was Jim's second story about what happened. Later that night, Jim had woven a third story for police, this time providing a fuller picture of what had supposedly happened that night. According to Jim, Danny was playing a television video game when the two got into an argument. That game was an Atari. The argument was about a trip to Europe, where Jim was going to buy some antiques. Jim was supposed to take Danny, but then decided to take his longtime friend, Joe Goodman. Jim said, quote, Danny went wild, going around breaking things, after he told him he was taking Joe instead. He told police that Danny was raging and that he had never been so afraid for his life. Then he said Danny went to the study and grabbed a gun. Danny fired shots at Jim and Jim returned shots. According to Joe Goodman, Jim's companion for the European trip, Jim called him at around 2 a.m. the night of the murder to tell him that the trip was canceled. Joe said that Danny even got on the phone to make sure there were no hard feelings. A short 10 to 15 minutes later, Joe received a second call from Jim, and Jim told him, come down here, I had to shoot Danny. Joe said that before Jim was arrested, he told him this story, quote, I always keep my composure. I went to my desk and I sat down. I just went in my office and sat down and started doodling. Jim said that within minutes, Danny came in with a gun. This was, of course, a fourth version of events that Jim told someone at the scene. This wasn't the first time that Jim and Danny had an altercation that ended in a call to the police department. Around a month earlier, on April 3rd, Jim called the police. When they arrived at the Mercer house, Jim told police that Danny had shot twice into the floor. On the night of Danny's death, Jim told officers a slightly different version of what happened during that previous incident, saying, quote, Danny got screwed up, threatened my life, shot at me two or three times. Jim was arrested that night, much to his entitled frustration. Depp Kirkland recounted how, when he told an officer to arrest Jim, Jim looked at Kirkland and said, quote, if I'd wanted to, I could have shot you. 
There's another pistol in this table. He was referring to the side table next to where he was sitting on the couch. Judge Eugene H. Gadsden was called in the middle of the night, and an ad hoc bond hearing was held in Judge Gadsden's house. That's the kind of influence Jim's wealth afforded him. He was given a $25,000 bond and was released later that same day. It wasn't until over a month later, on June 12, 1981, that Jim was indicted for murder. Jim sat down for an interview with the Georgia Gazette. During the interview, Jim detailed his version of events, which Depp Kirkland said, quote, provided us with a virtual blueprint against which to set the physical evidence. This would be Jim's fifth retelling of events, according to Depp Kirkland. Jim said that Danny first moved in with him in late March. He said he and Danny went to a movie at a drive-in on the evening of May 1st. By the time they got home, Danny had smoked nine joints and drank half a pint of whiskey. Jim said, quote, I thought what he had consumed was far better than all the other pills he used to take. He had come a long way in the two years I had been working with him. In the living room, Jim and Danny then played the Atari game Jim had just bought for Danny. As Jim got up to leave the room, Danny accused him of not enjoying the game. Then Danny grabbed Jim by the throat and said, You've been ill. Why don't you just go off someplace and die? Then, as Jim put it, Danny stomped the Atari to death and began breaking furniture in the living room. Jim decided to go into his office and sit down at his desk. Danny went into the office and said, I'm leaving tomorrow, to which Jim replied, that's fine. That's when, according to Jim, Danny left the room before coming back and pointing a gun in Jim's vicinity. Danny said, you're leaving tonight, and let off some shots. Jim said he didn't know how many times Danny shot at him, maybe once, twice, three times. In this version of events, Jim said that he told Danny after he fired the shots, quote, That's fine, Danny. If you can get it out of your system that way, that's fine. Now let's put the guns away. Jim also told the Georgia Gazette that Danny, quote, dropped by to pick up a few dollars for a date. But he told police that Danny, quote, came home at 2 a.m. Jim said that Danny knocked over a grandfather clock, which was valued at $10,000, and smashed it. At his first trial, Jim would say Danny turned over a $20,000 lacquered clock and smashed it beyond belief. Jim also detailed the incident between him and Danny from April 3rd during the interview. Deb Kirkland said this story had many inconsistencies compared to the actual police report from that night. For example, Jim told the newspaper that Danny, quote, destroyed thousands of dollars worth of antiques during an argument but Jim had told the police that the damage was only about $600. Jim's penchant for creative storytelling about a real crime would hurt him in his trials. I'm going to pause now to hear a final word from today's sponsors. Opening statements for Jim's first trial began on January 25th, 1982, and it would take seven days. The judge barred any mention of Danny and Jim's sexual relationship. The prosecution theorized that Jim murdered Danny and then staged the scene. Danny didn't have any gunpowder residue on his hands, so how could he have fired a gun first? Jim didn't kill Danny out of self-defense, as his defense team would later argue. To stage the scene, Jim shot Danny with the gun police found on the desk. Then Jim shot at his desk and chair with a second gun, the gun that was found under Danny's hand. This decoy shot ended up hitting a piece of metal that was in a stack of papers on the desk, causing metal fragments to land on the chair where Jim said he had been seated when Danny fired the shots. If Jim had truly been seated when Danny supposedly shot towards him, there would not be metal fragments found on the chair. The prosecution suggested that the chair had been on its side when Danny was killed. In Jim's rush to stage the scene, he flipped the chair back on its feet, but didn't realize he had put a chair leg on Danny's pant leg. Jim's defense team simply said that the police must have put the chair there. 
They didn't explain how that could have happened or a reason why. The defense said that Jim only shot Danny after Danny first fired his gun. Jim testified that Danny had been drinking when he became angry and threw Jim against a door. Danny then went into a hallway, knocked over a grandfather clock, and came back to the study where Jim was. By this point, Jim said he was sitting down behind the desk. He claimed that Danny shot at him but missed, so Jim quickly pulled out a gun from the desk and fired three shots at Danny. Jim testified that Danny had been violent previously, including the events from that night in April. A police officer testified that Jim's story about the night of April 3rd was false. The officer had been called to the scene, and when he got there, he said he found Danny sleeping in bed next to a bullet hole in the floor. The officer testified that he couldn't tell if the bullet hole was new or old. The defense also brought up another violent incident involving Danny in an attempt to make sure the jury knew Danny was violent and capable of bad things. In June 1979, an apparently intoxicated Danny was admitted to the hospital after he got into an argument with his landlord. The landlord ended up hitting Danny with a stick, and Danny had to get some stitches. He was released two days later with notes from the hospital staff saying that Danny had been cooperative. This part, of course, was left out by Jim's defense. Jim took the stand and said, quote, Danny came out of the living room in a rage, like a wild person, and he, he had never physically touched me in any way before, but he grabbed me right here, gesturing to his own throat, and said, quote, with the strength of ten men, with a look in his face that would have turned you to stone and scared you to death. Note how he pointed out that Danny had never touched him in any way before. After this, he said Danny said, You are sick. You are sick. Why don't you do everybody a favor and go out in the woods and die? And he threw me against the interior door. He said, Go out in the woods and die and do everybody a favor. And he threw me with such force that I bounced back. I had never been so afraid in my entire life. Jim said he ran to his study and had the phone in his hand to call police when Danny came in raging. Danny asked Jim who he was calling. Jim told the jury, quote, I had to think real quick. I mean, he was acting so erratic. Jim explained how he tried to supposedly calm Danny down. Quote, I said, well, he had complained earlier about Joe Goodman and the trip to Europe. Something about, you gave my trip to Europe away, and I said, I'm going to call Joe Goodman and just get this whole thing straightened out right now. I'm just going to tell him that the trip to Europe is off. He sat down right across from me. Then Jim said, I put my finger straight out, and I said, Danny Hansford, you're not going to tear my house up anymore. Now you get out. He said Danny responded by saying, I'm leaving this town tomorrow, and walked out of the study. Jim said he heard loud noises in the hallway. Then Danny came back to the study with one of Jim's guns. He said Danny walked into the study, turned at the corner of the desk, stated, but you're leaving tonight, and fired the gun at Jim. Jim said he grabbed his gun out of the drawer and fired back. Later in the trial, Jim was allowed to take jurors on a tour of the Mercer House, explaining that many of his antiques were worth over $100,000. He claimed that was why he had so many loaded guns around. Despite the judge's attempts to keep testimony of Jim and Danny's sexual relationship out of the trial, Danny's best friend, George Hill, made sure that was not going to happen. In his testimony, George Hill released damning information about the relationship. He testified that Danny received money, cars, and clothes in exchange for having sex with Jim. George said, quote, Danny just told me that he liked the money and everything, that if Mr. Williams wanted to pay him to suck his dick, then that was fine with him, and we let it go at that. George said that Danny would push Jim's buttons and make him mad on purpose so that he could get what he wanted. Danny would deliberately cause an argument with Jim and then leave the Mercer house. Then Danny would go back later, and Jim would feel bad and give him whatever he wanted. George said that Danny and Jim had been fighting that fateful night over Danny dating a girl. But Jim tried to deny the sexual relationship with Danny. To explain why he and Danny were always together, 
Jim said that one time Danny passed out at a party and was later diagnosed with hypoglycemia. According to Jim, Danny, quote, needed someone to be with him every minute. Jim told the court that Danny came by to check in with him often and would spend the night in his guest house. He said how often Danny stayed all depended on how he was feeling. Danny also worked part-time for Jim in his shop where he restored antiques. And he insisted that Danny had his own apartment. Jim told the court that Danny loved to play games as much as he did. They often played backgammon together. He said Danny would stay the night if he was, quote, not feeling too sharp. Which I guess he could be talking about the supposed hypoglycemia, or also he could mean when Danny drank too much. Also while on the stand, he acknowledged Danny's girlfriend, seeming like he was not jealous. On nights that Danny was with her, he would just see him the next day when he came to work in the shop. One of Jim's friends, Gregory Kerr, testified against him. I'm guessing he became a former friend after this, because the testimony was pretty lurid. He said that Jim told him Danny was good in bed and, quote, well endowed. Kara also claimed that Jim and Danny had argued over a $400 necklace just two nights before Danny was killed. He also said that Jim ordered Danny out of his house that night, and Danny was worried that he had lost his meal ticket. Kara said Danny told him that Jim bought all of his drugs. Apparently, Jim had given Danny that necklace so that he would break up with his girlfriend, but instead, Danny gave the necklace to Debbie. After deliberating for four hours on February 2, 1982, the jury found Jim guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. Despite this sentencing, Jim was allowed to remain out of prison on a 200000 appeal bond while he appealed his conviction and sentence. After the first trial, Jim's defense attorney received an anonymous copy of the police report from the night the police were called to the Mercer house on April 3rd, a month before the murder. Jim's defense team had not previously seen this part of the police report, which showed that the responding officer noted that the bullet hole was new. This was not what the officer had testified to during Jim's trial. In January of 1983, the Georgia Supreme Court reversed Jim's conviction and ordered a new trial. Several important changes took place during the second trial. First, Jim admitted that he was having a sexual relationship with Danny. Second, an expert for the prosecution testified that based on the blood on Danny's face and hand and the lack of a wound on Danny's hand, the expert concluded that Danny fell down on his right hand. Then Jim pulled Danny's hand from under his body and put the gun under it. Third, an expert for the defense testified that the type of gun found under Danny's hand only produced gunshot residue about 50% of the time. The expert also said that contact with blood can reduce gunshot residue. The prosecution and defense's theories remained largely the same. During this trial, the medical examiner of Cobb County, Joseph Burton, and the head of a Dallas crime laboratory, Dr. Charles Petty, were paid expert witnesses for the defense. Burton theatrically reenacted Jim's version of events using the actual furniture from the scene. Burton said Danny was standing in front of the desk, and Jim shot at him from behind the desk. And then he shot two more bullets from behind his desk. This time, Jim said that when he saw Danny draw his gun, he quickly grabbed his own gun out of the drawer and shot Danny. He claimed that the reason Danny missed was that the gun he chose had a 20-pound trigger which jerked Danny around as he pulled it, and so the shot went into Jim's desk chair after ripping through some papers on the desk. On October 8, 1983, Jim was found guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. The laws had changed, and an appeal bond was no longer permitted in murder cases, so Jim went to jail. In June 1985, the Georgia Supreme Court overturned Jim's conviction and ordered a new trial. The court found that the prosecution should not have been allowed to have an expert testify that Jim put the gun under Danny's hand. By having this expert, the prosecution was breaking the rule that a party, quote, may not employ an expert to argue and bolster its theory of the case where neither the ultimate issue of fact nor the method of proving that fact 
are beyond the average juror's comprehension. It's basically saying the jury was not smart enough to understand them. Anyway, the court also concluded that the prosecution, quote, improperly discussed facts that were not in evidence in its closing argument. In closing arguments, the state had argued, quote, that heavy trigger pull could not have caused the victim's alleged shot to miss the appellant at close range. Thus, the victim did not fire a shot. To illustrate his point, he asked an assistant district attorney who reportedly weighed around 100 pounds to point the pistol at a wall and pull the trigger. This was improper because they were introducing the evidence during a closing statement, which basically means that they should have done this theatrical stunt in rebuttal to Jim's own testimony instead of saving this for the closing argument. But moving on, Jim's third trial began on May 19, 1987. The trial proceeded similarly to the first two, with one exception. The defense had subpoenaed hospital records showing that Danny's hands had not been actually bagged before his body left the Mercer house. The defense had also spoken with a nurse who had received a phone call from the medical examiner telling her that she needed to bag Danny's hands. The nurse testified that she had put plastic garbage can liners around Danny's hands before his body was taken for an autopsy. A defense expert testified that the liners could have caused excess moisture, which can wash away gunpowder residue. And there was another difference. Evidently, Jim had not come off well in front of previous juries. They found him arrogant. So in an effort to make Jim more likable, they told him to cool it this time when he was under cross-examination. Jim's solution to this request was to take a Valium. On June 9, 1987, the 16-day-long trial resulted in a hung jury and a mistrial was declared. There was only one holdout for acquittal on the jury and she would not budge. The defense motioned to ban a fourth trial on grounds of double jeopardy, but that motion was denied. In preparation for the fourth trial, the defense sought a change of venue. The motion was granted, and the trial began in Augusta, Georgia on May 1, 1989. In John Barrett's book, he pointed out Jim's lawyers were happy with Augusta, the second oldest city in Georgia, which had a lot of old money. The Augusta National Golf Club was home to the annual Masters Tournament. But regardless of whether they came from the rich homes on the hill or the lower-income homes near the swamp, these jurors had never heard of Jim Williams. Barrett pointed out that these people wouldn't know about the Grand Mercer House or all the Jim Williams socialite gossip. Also, one juror admitted in voir dire that while he, quote, had no use for gays, he didn't care if they lived somewhere else. Jim's lawyers had long suspected his homosexuality had hurt their case. While on the stand, Jim testified that Danny had been drinking and smoking pot that day. He claimed that Danny was, quote, never seated. He was walking around raising sand. I was scared to death. I was thinking about saving my life from a man who went crazy and just shot at me with a pistol. Suddenly, he started raving about his mother and his girlfriend. Jim claimed that he tried to call the police, but Danny grabbed the phone. Danny started destroying the house and eventually brought a gun back into Jim's study. Again, Jim testified that Danny said, I'm leaving tomorrow, but by God, you're leaving tonight. Jim looked at Danny and realized he had a gun, so Jim opened the door to grab a gun for himself, and that's when Danny fired at him, so Jim fired back. He didn't even realize how many times he fired back. He said, quote, I had to protect myself. It happened so fast. I wasn't taking too many notes. I was absolutely in shock. He was very dead. When asked about his sexual relationship with Danny, Jim said, it was at Danny's instigation. It was a brief sort of thing. He insisted that both he and Danny had girlfriends. So, quote, it didn't last any time. It didn't amount to anything. He was definitely minimizing though he did admit to the sexual relationship. At this trial, the defense had a second nurse testify that Danny's hands had not been bagged after his body arrived at the hospital. A funeral home employee also testified that he didn't see any bags on Danny's hands. 
One of Danny's former girlfriends also testified, surprisingly though, for the defense. She said that Danny, quote, drank too much, did a lot of drugs, didn't want to work, and was hostile towards Jim. On May 12, 1989, 10 days after the eighth year anniversary of Danny's death, Jim was acquitted. It was finally over. The jury spent just one hour in deliberation, and the defense wasn't surprised. One of Jim's attorneys said jurors were laughing during his closing remarks, and they never laugh if they're going to convict. At the time, Jim was the only person to have lived through four murder trials in Georgia. He had spent an unbelievable total of $1 million on attorneys and expert witnesses. After the verdict, former Chatham County Chief Assistant District Attorney Depp Kirkland pointed out that Jim Williams had unlimited resources, causing the criminal justice system to work at its, quote, best and worst. Quote, seldom is a murder case tried four times. The great advantage of seeing multiple trials of the same defendant on the same facts is the ability to see changes in strategy, approach, and unfortunately even testimony when there are plentiful Benjamins to fund the battle and very little in the way of ethics to restrain the combatants. I also really like Depp Kirkland's writing. I think he's very eloquent. A little over eight months after his acquittal, on January 14, 1990, at around 8 p.m., Jim Williams was found dead by an employee. According to Depp Kirkland, Jim, quote, died lying across the threshold of his study wearing nothing but a white t-shirt. His arms were bent up to his chest, his hands in loose fists. Had Danny Hansford's right hand been placed back underneath him, their positions in the end would have been strikingly similar. Jim Williams was 60 years old. At his autopsy, it was noted that Jim had probably died the night before he was found dead. His causes of death were listed as a combination of congestive heart failure, cardiac arrest, and unknown, with some sources saying pneumonia. And of course, because he was a gay man, there were whispers that he had died of AIDS, but it was only a rumor. Throughout the years of Jim's four trials, it is alleged that Jim would see a voodoo priestess named Minerva. According to author John Barrent, Minerva tried to teach Jim that, quote, to understand the living, you must commune with the dead. Minerva believed that Danny killed Jim. She had told Jim many years prior that he needed to, quote, ask that boy for forgiveness, but Jim always refused. This case was huge in Georgia at the time, but author John Barrett's nonfiction novel about Jim and Danny, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, catapulted the story to national fame. The book spent a record-breaking 216 weeks on the New York Times hardcover bestseller list and was even a finalist for the 1995 General Nonfiction Pulitzer Prize. Barrett and many critics called it a nonfiction novel rather than a true crime book on purpose. Like I said, he took liberties with the timeline and fabricated some scenes in the book. According to Island Packet Newspaper, the novel helped make Savannah a tourist destination. So much so that the Bird Girl statue in the Bonaventure Cemetery, featured on the cover of the book, had to be moved to Telfair Museum's Telfair Academy, where it is still on display for museum visitors. In 1997, the movie adaptation of the book, directed by Clint Eastwood and starring Kevin Spacey as Jim, was released. Despite mixed reviews, the wonderful cast brought to life the eccentric Savannians in full living color. Particularly, a transgender drag performer known as the Lady Chablis. She is a central character in the book and movie, but she did not testify in court. That was an artistic liberty Eastwood took in the movie. And it's easy to see why. The Lady Chablis is mesmerizing. She insisted on playing herself in the film, and Clint Eastwood had no problem with that. He probably would have had a harder time trying to cast her. Later, author John Barrett said in interviews he didn't really like Kevin Spacey's portrayal of Jim Williams in the movie version of his book. He said, quote, He talked as if he were in a fog or sleepwalking. When he realized why, he thought it was hilarious. 
he had offered Spacey his own tapes of Jim speaking, but Spacey declined, saying he already had tapes of Jim Williams. Barrett believes he listened to Jim's testimony when he was on Valium. Barrett said, quote, Spacey is a terrific mimic. He was mimicking Jim Williams on drugs. If I have a grumble with the movie, it is the made-up love story between the author's character called John Kelso in the film with Mandy, who was a real woman in the book, but she was never in a relationship with the author, who is in fact himself gay. I hesitated to bring up this fact because while John Barrett is gay, it is rarely discussed in mainstream interviews. But after digging, I found he has given many interviews to LGBTQ publications like the Seattle Gay News. When that newspaper asked him how he felt about the film turning his role into a straight man who had an affair with a beautiful Savannian, Barrett answered, quote, I think it was a marketing decision and it turned out to be a mistake because the love interest was perfunctory and didn't go anywhere. I think he was right. And Barrett's unique access and friendship with Jim Williams, a semi-closeted gay man, colors the novel much differently when you realize the journalist interviewing Jim is gay himself. It is also relevant to his close relationship with Lady Chablis. Chablis took hormones regularly to help her become the curvaceous woman you see on screen but she never wanted to have gender reassignment surgery. Lady Chablis was proud of her sexuality, referring to being transgender and performing in cabaret as, quote, hiding her candy. She later named her autobiography that. And she was clearly flirting with the real John Barrett, as well as the straight John Kelso we see on screen. As an author, Barrett didn't name his character in the novel, and many writers might believe that putting too much of his own story into this nonfiction book would be inappropriate. But he does put himself in the book. He goes into great detail of how he came to Savannah, why he was drawn there, and why he wanted to tell this story. He is in every part of the book. He is even in one fascinating scene where supposedly Jim Williams confessed to him what really happened, that Danny's gun didn't actually go off because the safety was on, and that he shot him anyway and that right before Jim was about to tell his own attorneys, they found out they had the evidence from the nurse at the hospital, so Jim Williams left it alone. By the time the novel was finished, Jim was already dead, and therefore not around to dispute this scene. It could have been one of the fabricated scenes, which is why I left it out of the court portion of this episode. But I do think it's important that while he put so much of himself into the book, by leaving out his own sexual orientation, he allows Savannah itself to seduce a reader of any sexuality. But the real story is about a gay man who shot his gay lover. There is no getting around that, as much as Jim Williams tried to in his first trial, and as much as he wanted to keep the truth from his mother. His attorneys pointed out to him that she had been there for most of the testimony. Jim replied, yes, but she has not heard it from me. And so, in following trials, Jim's mother was put on the witness list so that she would be barred from listening to his testimony. While this case is salacious for many reasons, Jim and Danny's relationship was the biggest scandal. But it is also intriguing because there is no way to know what really happened that night. It is rare that someone has the endless financial means to fight a murder case in this way. Jim was ultimately acquitted of Danny's murder. But we'll never know if Jim was truly defending himself that night or if he lost control in a jealous rage and murdered his lover. Since Jim's death, the Mercer House, now known as the Mercer Williams House, has become a tourist destination where visitors can tour the museum to learn about Savannah's history and shop for vintage items in the old carriage house shop. Their website describes Jim's preservation and restoration of the Mercer House, but makes no mention of the two deaths that took place in the home. And the tour most definitely does not point out the place on the Oriental rug in Jim's study where both his and Danny's bodies were found. If you're superstitious, you may think it's karma. Or like the voodoo priestess Minerva thought, Danny took his revenge 
since Jim never apologized to his spirit. I think of it as an interesting coincidence, another mystery we will never unravel in this very intriguing Southern Gothic tale. And since we can't know so many things in this story, I will go with Lady Chablis' most famous quote. I just love the way she looked at life. Things just happen that we can't understand and certainly can't change. So as the lady so eloquently said, two tears in a bucket, motherfuck it. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by Hannah Newcomb, with additional research, writing, and editing by me. The audio is edited and mixed by Ches Gray of Gray Multimedia. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you've never read Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Barrett, I can't recommend it enough. The story he weaves is not a traditional true crime novel. You will lose yourself in this hothouse, seductive world of Savannah, as well as learn about this fascinating crime. And also, please see Clint Eastwood's movie, if for nothing else, to see the real Lady Chablis, the ultimate scene stealer. But for this episode, a major source was Deb Kirkland's book, Lawyer Games, After Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. As the original ADA on the case and one of the first investigators on the scene, his insight is invaluable to understanding the real Jim Williams and Danny Hansford. It is a clear-eyed, focused look at this case and explains well how Jim Williams got four trials and an eventual acquittal. As he says, it's all about the Benjamins. A full list of sources we used will be on my website. Just hit the link provided in the show notes. And now on to regular business. If you're not already a member, come join my Facebook group. While we do discuss crime, we also share memes and have a lot of laughs. We worship our patron saint, Dolly Parton, and our motto is no shit ass is allowed. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept case suggestions on social media private messages. But please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little-known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.